You are listening to the podcast of Calvary Church in Irwin, Pennsylvania. For more information, you can visit us online at calvaryirwin.com. Good afternoon, everyone. It is great to have you join us for Christmas at Calvary. My name is Nick. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are just blessed that you chose to celebrate Christmas Eve with us in person online. And uh, the video you just saw is from our Christmas care program. It's just wrapped up. Uh, that video was shot about a week and a half ago, so those numbers are actually updated. Um, thanks to the generosity of our church and so many in our community, uh, we were able to help this year with our Christmas care program. 42 families, 101 kids. We help provide gifts for those kids. Uh, we pr- help provide, uh, our sponsors help provide 29 Christmas meals with 64 sponsors. And we were just so grateful. <laughs> Amen. And this is something that is the heartbeat of our church. We're here to care for people. And I just want to say thank you. So many that, uh, with all of the different options that we have for charitable giving and serving, uh, that people make Calvary a priority for that. And we are so grateful. We're, we're not just helping people physically, but we're helping them holistically, that, that God is using us to impact them in a physical way, but also in a spiritual way. So thank you so much for those that are part of that program. Uh, one last thing, uh, in two weeks, the first Sunday of January, we're kicking off a new series called When the Church Prays. And uh, maybe you think, like, that sounds really boring and drab. Uh, I don't like to pray because that just seems like I fall asleep. Um, we're not talking about that. We're talking about something special happens when the church, when the church doesn't just go through some ritual, but when the church connects to the power of God, when there is something tangible that takes place inside of us as followers of Jesus, and we gather together collectively, then the church is ignited, the world around it is transformed. And that's our hope and prayer, that God would ignite something in us in this new year to transform our world. Not, not so we can just have a better religious experience, but so that the world outside these walls is changed and transformed. So I hope you can join us in two weeks, uh, 10.30 every Sunday in January as we start that new series, When the Church Prays. Now, one of, uh, one of the classics that so many of us watch every Christmas, and I'm sure you've seen this, is a Charlie Brown Christmas. It's now on Apple Plus, so if you can't find it, uh, I had to track it down myself to watch with our kids. It's on Apple Plus. Um, but... Uh, uh, Charlie Brown Christmas is one of those like favorites, right? Uh, the animated TV special aired for the first time in 1965, and it has been wowing people ever since. It tells the story, if you're not familiar, uh, it tells the story of Charlie Brown and his struggle to come to peace with what Christmas has become. It's in one of the mo- most pivotal moments of this TV special, Charlie B- Brown goes out to buy a Christmas tree with Linus. If you remember this scene, they go to the, the like kind of tree place to buy a tree. They have like the metal ones and then they have real ones. I don't know where the metal ones, if you were alive in the 60s, maybe you remember the metal ones. I do not, but I guess that was a thing. And they decide, no, we don't want that. And, and Charlie Brown lands on this sad little sapling, this little Christmas tree that was sad. And Linus is trying to talk him out of it. Like, don't, you don't want to get that one. He's determined he's going to buy that one. He, Charlie Brown is convinced that if he could just decorate the tree, it'll look better. Like, if, if you just put enough decorations on the little sad tree, it'll look happy and, and wonderful. Uh, when they return, however, Lucy and the others make fun of him and uh, of this new tree, and they walk away laughing. And devastated, Charlie Brown stands there and asks the big question of the whole special. He asks if anyone knows what Christmas is all about. And that paves the way for Linus to have his big speech. And Linus drops his blanket, which is pretty profound if you know anything about peanuts, and he walks to the center of the stage, the light comes on, and he goes into this big speech where he is quoting Luke chapter two, the true meaning of Christmas. And while this entire Christmas special is cute, it oozes with nostalgia, it's one of those annual traditions that so many uh, watch every year, what really makes this TV special so important is that after almost six decades of it airing, it still is one of the best snapshots of our annual struggle with the holidays. We struggle with all the busyness, the emotions, and all of the expectations that come with this season. From dealing with loss, to trying to pay for everything, to working so hard to keep up with the Joneses, Christmas can be incredibly magical, but it is still very, very challenging. And and if we're really honest, Christmas seems to have drifted so far from the peace on earth, goodwill toward men that Linus spoke of and that we read about in Luke chapter two. Maybe like Charlie Brown, you've thought 
that if you can just dress up with the ugliness of this season, or, or maybe, maybe if you can just hide the struggle of the Christmas season, maybe it'll make things a little better or make everyone a little happier. But can I be honest with you? Dressing up the ugly tree doesn't make it any less ugly. Is that true? I don't know what you do for Christmas trees. We go buy a Christmas tree every year, like a real one, and cut it down, and, and we spend all this time trying to find the right tree. There's no perfect tree. But you also don't want the sad sapling. It doesn't matter how many decorations you put on it. It's still gonna be ugly. The peace on earth spoken of in Luke chapter two and by Linus isn't a peace that is achieved through perfect circumstances. Because if that were true, the first Christmas would have fallen far short of that standard. And in fact, not only was the first Christmas far from perfect, but it had the makings of a total disaster. It had the makings of a tragedy. You see, the most perfect person to ever be born, the son of God, God in the flesh, was born into some of the most imperfect circumstances. And don't take my word for it, but see, hear what it says in Luke chapter two. And, and, and what I love about the Bible is the Bible doesn't just paint this rosy picture that everything's awesome and perfect. Like, uh, it's not always perfect. But the, the Bible paints a real picture of real life and what real people do to walk through that. And here's what, what we read in Luke chapter two, starting in verse six. Here's what it says. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. Now, these verses have become this beautiful, almost poetic picture of Christmas. But when you think about the reality, when you look at the reality of what was happening, it was far from this beautiful, poetic picture. The the verses we just read uh, are, are, when you dive into the cultural context, are totally different than what we've often perceived them. Based on the best estimates by scholars, Mary and Joseph's 90-mile trek from Nazareth to Bethlehem, which is the journey they took, hey, 90 miles, and some of you tomorrow for Christmas are gonna journey maybe 90 miles, and you're like, that's not that big of a deal. Well, you have a car. They didn't have cars. Uh, 90 miles would have taken somewhere around four days. That's based on them going two and a half miles an hour for eight hours every day for four days. So it could have taken a little bit longer if they took a little longer. In other words, for eight hours every day, Mary, who was nine months pregnant, would have been on the back of a donkey or a mule, not some luxury vehicle, on the back of that donkey for eight straight hours. And then, if that wasn't enough, she would have done that for at least four consecutive days. Sounds horrible. Uh, and, And then after all the travel, once they arrived in Bethlehem, they would have likely gone to the home of relative and stayed there. Now, you might be like, well, where's the inn and the innkeeper? We've kind of have this story uh, that we've depicted of an inn and innkeeper, and you know, they go to the front door of the Motel 6 and, and say, hey, we need a room, and the innkeeper's like, there's no vacancy here at inn, Motel 6, um, but we have a barn in the back with some animals, because that's what Motel 6 does. They just have barns in the back, and, and you go to the barn in the back, and, that, and you can have your baby there. That, that's the story we've kind of, we've painted. Well, if you actually read Luke chapter two, there's no mention of an inn or an innkeeper. Uh, culturally, more likely, what would have happened is Joseph was going to Bethlehem because his family was from there, so he would have gathered with other relatives at a home of a relative, and homes in Bethlehem weren't large. Homes at that time weren't large. They didn't have like a, a bathroom with an ensuite, or a bedroom with an ensuite bathroom for everybody where they were nice and cushy, um, they would have probably all piled into at least one room, if not two rooms. Now, if you're literally stressed about, you know, Christmas Eve or Christmas tomorrow with all your relatives, imagine staying in the same room with them, like for days, sleeping in the same room. That's what was taking place. That was, that's what happened. Now, when Mary was ready to have the baby, she, of course, didn't need an audience, Definitely not an audience of family members and relatives, right? So they would have gone downstairs. Now, in, in that time, like uh, at the basement or the, the bottom level of a home, that was where they would keep the animals. Animals that would provide food and nourishment for them. It might be milk or other things. Uh, and they would keep those in the bottom, bottom room. So Mary and Joseph, mostly because they didn't want an audience when the baby was gonna be born, would move down there. And that's where they would give birth to this child. And, and after all the craziness, This is where they would have had the baby. And to top things off from there, after giving birth, Mary would have wrapped him in cloths used to clean and care for the animals. 
So like, hey, we just wiped the, uh, the, the cow's slop off of his mouth. Let's wrap the baby in it. That makes a lot of sense. Sounds very uh, clean and sanitary, of course. Not really. <laughs> then for a bed or a crib, he was placed in a soft yet scratchy manger, hay-filled feeding trough. And, and we oftentimes in our manger scenes have these pictures of a feeding trough that's like real nice and wood and, and it looks comfortable. Well, that's not feeding, feeding troughs what they had. Back then, they would have most likely used a stone one. So stone is a little less soft than wood. But that's what they placed the baby in. And if you struggle getting your baby to sleep at night and you're like putting it on that really nice uh, memory foam mattress in the crib and the temperature is just right, the sound machine is just right. You've got like everything perfect. Now imagine trying to put a baby to sleep in a place with animals, livestock, hay, on a stone feeding trough. Like crazy. But this is what Mary, her experience was. And, and when you look at the details, the Christmas story may not have been as magical as we might think. But the reality is it was still very special. And, and, and here's what's crazy. With all that we know about what happened in these memorable moments, as as disastrous as it might appear to us, Luke, in Luke chapter two, Luke records Mary's perspective of the whole thing. And Mary's perspective is like mind blowing. Because any of us would be like, this is a mess. Like, let's call it off. Let's go back to Nazareth. Joseph, this is crazy. I don't care if Caesar has called us to here. This is horrible. We're not doing this. We're done. But Mary, her view of what was taking place was so drastically different. Listen to what it says in, Mary, in Luke chapter 2, verse 19. Listen to this. But Mary treasured. Do you see that? Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. How in the world does she treasure this disaster? How is that possible? Like, like what was taking place here could even make Clark Griswold cringe. Like that's how bad it was. But she treasured it. This was possible because the peace that the angels would speak of to the shepherds, the, the peace that Mary embodied was the same peace Linus spoke about in the Charlie Brown Christmas. It's a peace that's based on the condition of your heart, not the circumstances in your world. We are living at a time where wars are taking place across the globe as families are losing in a moment what's taken a lifetime to build. There's constant fear of disease. Weather is wreaking havoc in all corners of the world. Just as a side note, I wish, I wish, I wish weather would wreak havoc with some snow uh, today and tomorrow, but it doesn't look that way, so apologies. But, but like weather is going crazy. Uh, beyond that, there's unrest present nearly everywhere. And if you watch the news or scroll social media for any period of time, the logical question you might ask is in that kind of a world, in the kind of world that we live in right now, in what you read on social media or you see on the news, how in the world is it possible to have peace? How is that even logical? How can we have peace in such a difficult, unsettling time? And it's because the peace of God is not determined by the ideal circumstances, but the proper posture of our heart. We're, we're, our peace that God speaks of, the peace that Jesus embodied, wasn't tied to the perfect circumstances. Because if it was, Mary would not have treasured all of these things. If it was, no one would have found peace because Jesus wasn't born into a peaceful time. He was born in a time where Rome had, had taken over Israel. They were captives, essentially to a bigger empire. This wasn't a peaceful time, but peace was possible because it's not determined by the ideal circumstances. And this Christmas, as we strive for peace in our home, peace in our world, and peace in our lives, I wanna walk through some questions that we glean from the Christmas story that you can ask yourself when peace seems absent in your life and your, your home over the next few days. Three, three simple questions that we're gonna walk through that we glean from this Christmas story. The first one is, are you focusing on the details or the direction? I, I love details. I think they're important, valuable, and worth our effort. But I also recognize that when we focus too much primarily on details, it will only produce more stress and anxiety. Rather than getting too obsessed about all the decorations hanging properly, the cookies being made just right, or all the kids matching just perfectly, what's the ultimate direction you're hoping for with your celebrations and gatherings this Christmas? Where do you want them to end up? 
Most of the details for Mary and Joseph were all wrong. But, that, but that's not what was important to them in that moment. It was the direction they were headed in. Whether they arrived with wrinkled clothes, whether their hair was a mess, whether they smelled like donkey manure, it didn't matter. What mattered is that they ended up in the right place. In a few days, Christmas is gonna come to an end. Some of you are like, that's sad. Others of you are rejoicing. You're ready for that to be done. But in a few days, Christmas is gonna come to an end. What is it you are hoping to look back on and be grateful about this season? Focus on that. Focus on that direction, not just all the details. And the, question, the first question is, are you focusing on the details or the direction? The second question, are you concerned about the what or the who? Are you concerned about the what or the who? What we do, what we get, and what we see are usually what draws our attention and focus during this season. But let's shift our thinking. This Christmas, do your best to make the people around you your ultimate priority. The biggest concern for, Mary, for Joseph on this four plus day journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem wasn't all this stuff. It was that Mary and her unborn child made it to Bethlehem. That was their goal. It was that the people he loved were okay and that he was with those people. In fact, one, one day, the unborn child that w- Mary would give birth to, Jesus would stand in front of a crowd of people and he would make this statement. It's recorded in John chapter 10, verses 10 and 11. It said, he said this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And, and he's framing this, the thief speaking of the, Satan, comes to steal, kill and destroy. And he's framing this as bad because, not because things are being stolen, but because it affects people. And he said, but I have come for something else. Now, if, people, if things were the stuff, he would have said, but I have come that you might have more stuff. He's coming to steal, kill and destroy, but I've come that you might have more stuff. He doesn't say that. He says, but I have come that you might have life and life to the full. And then he goes on, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's talking to him about himself as the good shepherd. He's saying, people are such a priority in my life. I will lay my life down for their sake. Why? Because people were important to Jesus. And that's not just Jesus. If you read throughout from Genesis to Revelation, the entirety of scripture, people are always a priority to God. Jesus didn't die so that we can have church. Jesus didn't die so that we can have religious practice. Jesus died for people. Because to God, people are a priority. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for you and for me, for people. And, And if you want to experience the peace that God provides and he speaks of, it requires that we put priorities in his order. You see, when when priorities are out of order, we'll usually find our lives out of order as well. And and to get real for some of us today, what makes the holidays difficult and even possibly this Christmas a little sadder isn't the stuff you don't have. It's the people who are no longer here. It's because in the end, the people around us are the most important part of the season and really one of the most important parts of our lives. Can we shift our eyes from the stuff and the substance of this season that we oftentimes can obsess about? And can we shift it to the people that we will gather with, no matter how many or how few they might be? Because the people are their priority. So the first question is, are you focusing on the details or the direction? Number two, are you concerned about the what or the who? And number three, are you working to make an experience or a memory? Social media can push us to make an experience that's epic for family or friends. We want everything to be perfect and match that exact picture from Pinterest that we saw and we're decorating, trying to get it perfect. But what if, what if rather than working toward a perfect experience, we recognize the more transcendent benefit of a memory? Christmas morning might unravel into an utter disaster. But but when you're sitting back and looking at the disaster in front of you, far from the magical experience that you were hoping for, do you know that can still be a memory? Everything can still be a memory. I'll be honest with you, my wife and I, we have four kids, okay? And every year for Christmas, we have this plan. Here's the plan. Someone wakes us up way too early, usually my oldest, Zach, he'll wake us up at like some god-awful time that no one should be awake on Christmas Eve. And he's paying me back, because I did that to my parents. I think my record was 3 a.m., 
Hopefully he never hears that record, never strives for it. But he's gonna wake us up, someone's gonna wake us up. We're gonna go downstairs, groggy, and we'll sit down around the tree. I will open up the Bible, probably on my phone, and read the Christmas story from Luke chapter two. Then we'll pray, and then we'll open our gifts. That's our, that's our plan, that's our routine every year. Sounds perfect, very spiritual. I think it's important just putting things in place, but that's what we do, okay? Here's what will happen this year. It happens a lot of years. Within the first 10 minutes, the plan that we have will quickly unravel. So this year, this will probably happen tomorrow morning. I, I almost guarantee it. Within the first 10 minutes, someone will start screaming. Someone else will make the declaration, this is the worst Christmas ever. And we will sit back and ask, what has happened? How did we get to this place? Uh, with four young kids, like this is just what happens. B- but here's the deal. Like this is gonna happen. And, and this is a lesson I've learned over the decades of living life. That we can be so focused on the experience, which is really uh, about how people perceive something, that we miss the value and importance of the memory. And the memory is less about how people feel about something, more about what is now possible. And if we can focus on what is possible, maybe, maybe this could be a special year for you. In the magical scene that we picture in our mind of that first Christmas, we have Mary, this glowing Mary, who, mind you, had just given birth, next to Joseph, her soon-to-be husband, with the manger scene, you know, the little manger trough, feeding trough in between with Jesus, resting quietly and peacefully in the hay, which probably wasn't happening, but we'll go with it. And, and, and we look at that experience and we say, man, that's amazing. Do you know that that whole scene wasn't the result of a perfectly crafted experience? Like, how can we make sure Mary and Joseph feel good about this? How do we make sure Jesus feels good about this? How do we, how do we make everyone feel good? That, that's not what happened. That, that didn't happen, but Mary and Joseph were okay with it. Why? Because they recognized the history that was unfolding right in front of them. This was history, the son of God, God in the flesh laying right in front of them. And now, now, I don't think any of us are gonna be part of history in the way Mary and Joseph were tomorrow or in the next few days. But the truth is, you're still going to be part of writing your own family's history. That these next few days are history being written. And the question is, how can you make memories and write meaningful history? not just produce good TikTok or Instagram reels. How are you going to do that? that that's, that's the peace of God. Focus on the memories, not the experiences. And the three questions that we look at today are, are you focusing on the details or the direction? Are you concerned about the what or the who? And are you working to make an experience or a memory? You see, Christmas has the potential to be this wonderful time to remember the birth of our Savior, a time of light and hope and possibility. Don't let the light turn into a dumpster fire of of, of expectations. Let's not strive for perfection this Christmas. Instead, let's focus on peace. Not a peace based on perfect circumstances, but rather a peace that we experience when we have the proper posture of our hearts. This was the difficult lesson a fictional cartoon character named Charlie Brown had to learn but it's still a lesson we struggle to grasp in 2023. And whether you're five years old or 85 years old today, the question I wanna ask you is this important question. How are you finding peace in your life today? How are you finding peace in your life today? Maybe maybe you're here and, and, and you're here because it's Christmas Eve and you're not a church person and you're not a religious person. You wouldn't consider yourself any of those things and that's okay. Jesus wasn't real kind to the religious people anyway, if you read the gospels, but we're not here to be religious. But here's the question I have, how are you finding peace today? See, Jesus came and and, and was born to Mary and Joseph and, and, and about 33 or so years later, he would hang upon a cross, dying a criminal's death, not because he deserved it, but because he knew he would he had to, because he took on the punishment of our mistakes. And he rose again three days later. All of that happened, not so we can have Christmas and Easter, All of that happens so that you could have peace. And it's a peace that transcends our experience, our mistakes, our past, and our understanding. It's a peace that's not defined by the right circumstances. That's the peace that God gives us. 
It's a peace with our past that we can be forgiven and a peace with our future that, that, that God is gonna work all things for the good of those who love and are called according to his purpose. And if, if you're here today and, and you're watching the line and you're saying, man, Nick, I'm, I'm going through my church thing here, but this isn't about a church thing. This is about you and God, that's it. Can you be at peace with God, the creator of the universe? Could you actually be at peace with him and be at peace in your heart? That's, that's a, a peace that transcends circumstances. It's a peace where our posture, the posture of our heart is in the right place. And I wanna pray for you this morning and give you the opportunity to say, you know what, today, I wanna experience that forgiveness and that, that peace, the peace that, that Linus spoke of, the peace that God says is possible. That's the peace on earth, goodwill toward men that he was speaking of. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? God, I thank you. Thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. I thank you, Lord, that you are in this place. God, on this Christmas Eve, God, that you are speaking to people even here and those online, and I pray, God, that you would allow the peace of God that transcends our understanding to rest in our hearts and our minds today. As you're continuing to pray this morning, if you're here, you're watching the line, you say, Nick, today, today is a day more than just Christmas Eve, but I need to start something fresh and new. Today is a day, the Bible says, that we can be, you could be a new creation, that, that the old is gone, the new has come, that, that, that you can experience a peace of your past where you experience his forgiveness of all the mistakes you've done, but also a peace for your future, that you have a purpose and a reason for being. And if you're here and you've never taken that step to say, I want to not just be a, I want to be a church person or a Bible thumper or a religious person. I want to follow Jesus' way for my life. I want to follow God's plan for my life. If that's you this morning, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to just reach your hand toward heaven and I'm just going to pray, all of us together. This isn't a spiritual, magical thing. This is simply a conversation with God. It's all prayer is that I want to lead you in. If that's you, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to reach your hand toward heaven. One, two, three. If that's you this morning this afternoon, amen, amen. Anyone else today? Amen, anyone else? Amen. You can put your hands down. And, and everyone who raised their hand, but everyone else, that even if you didn't, I want you to pray this prayer with me. We're the family of God. We're a family here. We do things together. And, and what, whether, if, you, if you raise your hand, I want you to say these words from your heart, not just some empty words you're reciting. My hope is this is the first of many conversations you have with God as you share the good, the bad, the ugly of your life with him. Would you all pray this prayer with me together? Dear God, Thank you for loving me just as I am. Today, I accept your forgiveness of my past. I commit to live for your purposes. Let the peace of God rest in my heart and my mind. Give me the strength and the courage to follow you all the days of my life and to show your love to the world around me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Would you stand with me this morning? If you prayed that prayer, can I ask you to stop by the Connection Center? We wanna put some, some, a booklet in your hand to help you continue that journey, that, that the journey of peace and following Jesus isn't a one-moment thing, but a continual thing. In a few moments here, we're going to, we're gonna sing Silent Night together. We're gonna light the candles and close out the service before we walk out of this place, or maybe you jump off the live stream While we sing this song, can you take a few brief moments? Close your eyes, take a deep breath, soak in the moment, make a memory. Be thankful that you came today and you're already moving in the right direction. Take this moment in. Let's not rush through today and tomorrow, but recognize that God goes before us and he has made these days possible. We don't have to strive, work, or exhaust ourselves. Let's enjoy what he's already provided. And and today, on your way out, we have cards that have the questions we just talked about. You can grab on your way out. Uh, We have a a PDF uh, on a QR code. If you scan that, and put that on the screen, and, and you can scan that, take it with you on your phone. My challenge to you is we're gonna rush through the holidays and miss the peace of God. As you feel the, the, the stress rise up, ask yourself those questions. Where am I at right now? To help center yourself around what God intends for you so you have the right posture of your heart. And as we sing this song together, let's enjoy this moment. Let, let's not be thinking about what's happening next, like that's gonna come. But close your eyes, take a deep breath, and make the memory today. Let's sing this song together this afternoon.
This is Pastor Nick Poole, the lead pastor at Calvary. We're so glad you joined us for today's podcast. I hope you enjoyed the message. At Calvary Church, we're passionate about leading people into an overflowing life with Jesus. We would love the opportunity to connect with you on your faith journey and hear what God is doing in your life or join you in prayer for any needs you might have. You can visit us online at calvaryirwin.com or send us an email at info at calvaryirwin.com. On our website, you'll find previous week's messages, a list of upcoming events, as well as resources designed to help you take those next steps on your journey of faith. See you next week, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. 